coming up on Exploring Idaho. We'll show you some of the oldest art known to man. Then meet a man who's keeping the tradition of wood carving alive. Finally, go to North Idaho for some pike fishing on beautiful Lake Coeur d'Alene. Welcome. Today on Exploring Idaho, you're going to see how Native American art is like a thread woven through time, from its ancient beginnings to its modern day influence. So for our first story, we take you to some of the oldest artistic designs known to man. They're found throughout our state, carved on boulders and painted on cliff walls. The beginnings of art lie in the canyons and on the plains of Idaho. Thousands of years ago, the people who lived here etched their traditions and their visions into rock. They're called petroglyphs, and amazingly, they've endured thousands of years of wind, sun, and rain. Celebration Park sits at River's Edge on the north side of the Snake. It's one of the many sites in Idaho where you can find petroglyphs. Between 12 and 15,000 years ago, the Great Bonneville Flood carried huge boulders to the area like they were pebbles. When the flood retreated, water-worn rocks stayed behind. Early humans etched these smooth surfaces with elaborate symbols. They just take a, a little hammer stone and they just get here and go peck, 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 and you can see the individual pecks often. John Curtis is a retired scientist. He has studied petroglyphs for 15 years. One of the characteristics here is um, the arrays of dots, which are all over in the Snake River Valley. Curtis thinks early Paiute Indians made these images, but he'll rarely guess what they mean. I don't think anybody can interpret petroglyphs who was not really living here at the time they were made. Even if we don't know the exact meaning, you can recognize the figures. There's a sun symbol on that one. That's a mountain sheep symbol. See, this is a lizard rock. There's one, two, three, four, and maybe five lizards on this rock. Circles with dots in the middle. Remember I told you we'll see that a lot? They are pictures children can relate to. And here today to see the petroglyphs is a Meridian Elementary class. It just looked like a dragonfly. They've never studied anything like this before but they're quickly learning. <laughs> Pendulous? Petroglyphs. Petroglyphs. <laughs> There's a lot to learn, even for the casual observer. More than a dozen rocks in Celebration Park are covered with designs. One of the more unusual, this water-carved boulder called Bishop's Chair. Go down and sit in it. Curtis thinks this was a sacred site. Native tribes may have used this chair in some religious ceremony, or maybe they just liked the view. Man is a curious being. Man likes to solve mysteries. And when you find these inscriptions on the rocks that uh, you don't know what they mean, it's, it's just fun to try to figure it out. Across the Snake River, there are even more petroglyphs at Wee's Bar. It lies in a harsh desert canyon that has changed very little in thousands of years. Raptors circle overhead. Reptiles slither on the land below. Lizards look like modern day dinosaurs. It's a setting that makes it easy to lose touch with time. You can't drive to Wee's Bar. You must ferry across the river on a raft. Quick. 
current's going pretty good today. Larry Reidenauer is a park ranger for the Snake River Birds of Prey area. And Frank Jenks, a former archaeologist and recreation planner for the Bruno Resource Area. This is a fairly compact area. You get an awful lot of rock art. On land, dozens of petroglyphs cover this rock in a carpet of symbols. This is probably the most elaborate boulder in the, the whole field. Some designs are similar to those we've seen before. Others have a style all their own. It could be a communication. It could have been just somebody's uh, ideas or thoughts or a dream or could have religious significance. So it's interesting to just wonder about you know, what's behind the art. The symbols and this site remain sacred to modern Native Americans. Jenks says visitors must treat the area with respect. There's more than 70 uh, boulders with a significant amount of rock art at, at Weiss Bar. It, it's really kind of a special place and it kind of it has an ability to sort of transport people. Um, it's, a, it's a real connection with the past and with the, the natural world just to come here and look at these. If you spend any time looking for petroglyphs in Idaho, you're bound to come across another form of rock art. These paintings are called pictographs. The designs are similar, but not nearly as old as some rock carvings. Pictographs are a more recent reminder of native life in Idaho. The area surrounding the south fork of the Boise River was fertile ground for Shoshone tribes. They hunted deer here, they fished the Chinook and Steelhead runs, and they displayed images of that lifestyle with colorful rock paintings. This is the Danskin Rock Shelter, a well-known archaeological uh, site along the south fork of the Boise. Max Pavasic is a professor of archaeology with Boise State University. He says Danskin Cave was probably a short-term campsite used for hunting trips to the canyon. Over here is the main panel of the art. There are several images that you can see. Uh, the dots are called counts uh, or tallies. Uh, we're not sure what they're tallying and what they're counting, but they are a typical art motif. This is a mounted rider. You can see the human figure here on top of the horse. These paintings can be dated because of the images of horses. Pavisic says Europeans introduced the horse to Idaho around 1700. Above me here on the cave ceiling is a, a beautiful shield figure. It's a human image. In this instance, it's a stick figure. In the circle is a shield. Sadly, this pictograph has been vandalized. A lot of people have chalked these images uh, to photograph them. Our culture has uh, desecrated uh, this image. Along for the trip is Heather Lundberg. She's a biochemist with an interest in rock art. I can't imagine what it would have been like back when the people were painting this and living this. It's important because it, it uh, is a record of the human imagination. Here are images that meant something to people. Though we may never know exactly what these mean, we can see that like the artists of today, native painters look to the world around them for inspiration. It's neat to be able to see that they were here, that they saw the same things I did. They saw a heron on the river like we did today. Mm, isn't that something? And we've only shown you a few of the sites. There are hundreds more. So call the Idaho Historical Society or your local Chamber of Commerce for a map of the sites near you. We'll be right back. Still to come, the old time art of wood carving. Welcome back to Exploring Idaho. You know, in some ways, art really hasn't changed all that much since the days of the petroglyphs. Today's artists are still inspired by the things they see around them. Those of us less talented want to bring that sense of natural wonder into our homes. And so furniture, like these pieces crafted in Idaho, are gaining in popularity. You can see Mark Smith's appreciation for Native American art. He's a wood carver and furniture builder working just outside of New Meadows in central Idaho. There, Mark lives a life most of us only dream about. This old brick schoolhouse is a storybook setting for anyone who has ever wished for a simpler life. 
Like someone who works with their hands, chooses old over new, handmade over store-bought, rustic over polished. This dusty little shop on the second floor has been Mark Smith's workshop for 20 years. Mark's love of nature can be seen in his art. It seems that wood lends itself to representations of wildlife. When I started out, I was doing a lot of useful objects like boxes, containers, dinnerware, goblets, and that sort of thing. So it was a way of integrating elements of the natural world into people's lives. Aspects of the wood will suggest shapes and forms and subjects. Part of this came from the aspect of the tree itself that had a limb growing out here. It looked like an animal's nose. Mass I probably started into about 10 years ago or so. The idea is a fox headdress. You might think of it as the person transforming into the fox. That's where the fox's eyes are open in this particular one. It indicates that transition that's taking place between the human and the animal power. Much like Mark's vision of this wood pile, each branch waiting for his eye to see the arm of a chair or the leg of a table. I think that's got a nice shape to it. It's kind of fun, too, because you never know what kind of pattern is going to be revealed once you remove the bark. And again, that's what makes each piece so unique. While his furniture designs may look simple, hours of tedious work go into each piece. It isn't the type of thing you find in a store. It's not made on a production line. Some people call it, call it art furniture. It's going to be essentially one of a kind sculptures. The satisfaction is the end product that will be utilized by somebody and cherished and hopefully become something you could pass down to your children. Like many artists, Mark has dreamed of a work that would stretch his talents. A recent grant allowed him the freedom to try something new, something he's anxious to show off. This is a little bit uh, more dreamscape elements, which I like. That's, uh -huh. that's been fun. The entire work is kind of my personal interpretation of various aspects of this northern Rockies country we live in, from the prairie falcons on the top to the trees to the water representation in the seats to salmon, and then some of the prehistoric images of the people that were here before. Can I sit in it? Of course, they're made. <laughs> they're sculptural <laughs> furniture. They're made well. <laughs> The idea was an involvement with the participant viewer with this, this dreamscape that's created by the forms here. So you get to sit within this space. There's layers and layers of meaning. And then as you get closer and move into the pieces, then you start peeling back those layers. And more and more of the work starts revealing itself, which I think is, a, is one of the exciting things about really good art. <laughs> it really did solve its intention and that was to get you moving off into additional if not new directions and this project has kicked off many many ideas that I hope I'll get a chance to do. But luckily there's a big woods out there. <laughs> and by the way Mark is the first Idaho artist to receive a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts. We'll be right back. In Idaho, having a fishing license is just about as common as having a driver's license. So it's a good thing we have so many streams and lakes, and big ones too, like the ones you'll find in the panhandle of northern Idaho. Coeur d'Alene Lake has been called one of the five most beautiful lakes in the world, and who could argue? This much beauty inspires all kinds of recreation. One of the most popular, and certainly one of the oldest, is fishing. You can catch many kinds of fish here, but you just might find a real prize on the end of your hook. Lake Coeur d'Alene is one of the few places in the Northwest where trophy size, 20 pound northern pike still put up a good fight. You know, to have the chance to, to catch a really, really big fish, that's, that's what they come out here for. One lucky angler caught the state record pike right here. It weighed in at 38 pounds, nine ounces. The Smith brothers know the story well. 
They own the Fins and Feathers Tackle Shop in Coeur d'Alene, and they'd love to have their own record pike to brag about. We always say you got to go early, stay late, and cast often. Somewhere in between, you'll find a couple of nice fish. Pike aren't native to Lake Coeur d'Alene, but you'd never know it. Since they were accidentally introduced 20 years ago, they have flourished. Not only is there plenty of food for them here, there is just the right kind of cover to make them successful hunters. There's a nice set of cabbage weeds here, which the pike like, and wherever those weeds are, we go. This is a willow leaf spinner bait. Uh, it's one we throw in when we get in a little bit thicker cover, and it'll come through the weeds a lot better, so we'll see if this will get a fish. When they want it, they're going to come up out of that weed bed and just attack that thing. The northern pike is a voracious eater. One look inside this mouth, and you can see how they earned that reputation. It's kind of a one-way ride once you get in that mouth. It's uh, <laughs> all down the throat. The pike grow faster here than any other place in the world. They're especially active in the fall. While geese are flocking together, getting ready for their migration south, the pike are eating everything in sight fattening up for winter. 65 and sunny today. You couldn't ask for a better fall day unless we could catch a couple of nice pike. <laughs> well, we broke the ice anyway. That fish ain't a whole lot bigger than a plug. This is such a little one, but he still has a pretty good row of teeth. They are razor sharp, I mean, Razor sharp. They'll slice you in a second, even these little ones. But I'll get him back in and he should be fine. <laughs> Maybe there's one more that wants to bite. Now we're throwing a spoon. We're on a, we're on a uh, real defined weed edge and it's fairly deep. Uh, it's a little easier to, to fish that straight drop on a, with the daredevil than it is with the, any other type of lure. So we're gonna throw this one for a while and see if we can't find one that'll say hello. For pike fishing, you don't need a lot of fancy gear. With a sturdy rod, strong line, and a handful of lures, you're in business. It's a lot of work. Uh, you know, it's not for everybody. But if you like to fish aggressively, this is a good fish to fish for. You're always doing something. You're always working, you're always casting. You're always moving, and then they're real exciting to catch. Overhead, an osprey also thinks this is a good place to fish. And watch this. Now that's how to do it. Lake Coeur d'Alene supports the largest concentration of osprey in North America. It seems they're drawn here by the same things that make the lake so attractive to people. The thing we like about it, it's fairly diverse in, your, in the fishing. You know, if you like to troll, you can go after the salmon. If you like to cast like we are now, you can either go for northern pike or, or there's a good largemouth bass fishery in here also, which a lot of people don't even, they just don't think of this area as, as bass, but there, there's pretty good bass fishing in this lake. And somehow the fishing just seems better when you're surrounded by forested hills and crystal clear waters. This area has been called America's Switzerland, and indeed, the world-class Coeur d'Alene Resort carries that theme. Here, you can stroll along the world's longest floating boardwalk, or take a sunset cruise on the sparkling lake. This is such a big lake, you can't see it all or fish it all in one day. And that's why people like Jeff and Steve just keep coming back. You know, I've fished a lot of different places here, and I've still got a lot of places to try and still different fish to try. So we've got lots of challenges ahead of us yet. Plus, the fish, they're always a little smarter than we are, it seems like. And we never quite get them figured out. One guy told me, we're not supposed to catch them all the time. He says, they're full-time fish, and we're only part-time fishermen. If you'd like more information on any of the stories we've had on Exploring Idaho today, stay tuned. We'll have that for you next. Welcome back to Exploring Idaho. Here's how you can get more information on the stories you've seen on today's show. 
just call 1-800-443-2461 and ask for the field notes for show number 118. You've probably noticed this is an exceptional year for fall color in Idaho. So as we leave you today, we'd like to invite you to go along on a nature walk as we enjoy autumn in Idaho. We'll see you next time.